Good morning and welcome to the last series of our guardianship discussion with Erica Smith and Sancha Brennan. And we're so pleased to have you now for the third time collectively discussing these important guardianship issues. Of course, we've committed ourselves to this issue based on the comments that we've received from the public wanting to know a little bit more about guardianship issues and estate planning. My name is Kimberly Jackson, and I am the executive director for the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. We are a think tank embedded at St. Petersburg College at the Seminole campus. I want to get started, but I'll invite you to watch our future programs at the end of the discussion and tell you more a little bit about ISPF. With that, we're going to get started pretty early today since the presentations have had significant depth and we want to make sure that we get to the questions. Our first panelist again is Erica Smith, and she is a native of St. Petersburg and a longtime resident. She is a shareholder of Fisher and Sauls and the chair of the Wills Trust and Estates Department. Prior to joining Fisher and Sauls, she served for three years as an assistant city attorney for the city of St. Petersburg and spent two years in private practice, law, law office practicing in the areas of Wills, Trust and Estates, real property and corporate law. As an assistant city attorney of the city of St. Petersburg, she represented the mayor, city council, and city administration. And she had various areas of enforcement in terms of her practice areas. And our next presenter is Sancha Brennan. And Sancha is the managing partner of the Brennan Law Firm in Orlando, Florida. And since 2001, her practice has concentrated in the areas of guardianship, probate, and trust administration and real property transactions. She's published several articles on guardianship, probate, and real property law, and is the author of the annual updates to the legal treatise, Florida Guardianship Law and Procedure, and is in the process of drafting the new edition of that treatise. Ms. Brennan continues to lecture on a variety of guardianship, probate, and real property related topics to attorneys, guardians, real estate agents, and brokers, and to families with loved ones with varying special needs. And let me say, ladies, this has been a host of information um, you weren't able to join us, um, Sancha, last time, but of course, um, <laughs> your stand-in, David, did an excellent job of providing significant depth to the topic, as you likely know. <laughs> he has a lot of experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so with that, I'm going to let you pull up your presentations, and thank you again. And I'm going to invite uh, those who are participating with us today to please uh, put in any questions you have into the chat. Our programs are recorded, so of course, feel free to share them as well. And thank you, Erica and Sandra. Thank you, Kim. Good morning, everyone. Thank you again for being here. As Kim said, this is the third of a series of guardianship presentations. And this morning, we will be focusing on the area of guardian advocacy. You may remember that our first presentation was an introduction to various guardianship topics. Last month, we discussed incapacity guardianships under Chapter 744 of the Florida Statutes. This time, we will be discussing uh, guardian advocacy. So thank you for joining us. All right, we will go ahead and get started here. Guardian advocacy is, is primarily used, um, or at least I see it primarily used within my practice for parents who have a special needs child who is approaching or reaching the age of 18. The issue comes about because prior to a child attaining age 18, the natural guardian has responsibility for the child's welfare and property. And the natural guardian is defined by law as the biological or adoptive parent. So for parents with a special needs child, prior to the age of 18, they have typically not had any issue with making the child's uh, medical decisions, helping the child with various decisions as far as welfare, finances, but when a person reaches age 18, he or she has the legal right and responsibility to make decisions about his or her own welfare and property. So when a parent has a child who they have been helping and then that child is reaching age 18, parents are often anxious and concerned about how their child will do making decisions for himself or herself based on any special needs that they have. Today, we're going to explore what are the options available to protect a special needs individual once they have become an adult under Florida law and would otherwise have the legal right to make these decisions. Okay. 
there are two primary options if a if a parent of a special needs child feels like they are going to need uh, to help with decision making after they reach age 18. The first option is an incapacity guardianship like we talked about in the last session. And just to review, an incapacity guardianship is one in which an examining committee of three individuals meets with the, um, the proposed ward or the alleged incapacitated person, determines for the court whether or not that person meets the definition of being incapacitated, and then the court holds an adjudicatory hearing determining whether that person is indeed incapacitated under the law and should have certain rights uh, removed, either to be delegated to a guardian or simply removed. That is the first option for dealing with maybe a young adult who needs help with decision making is to have the, um, have the young adult be an alleged incapacitated person under one of these incapacity guardianship proceedings. Option two is what we're going to be discussing today, and that is a guardian advocacy. Guardian advocacies are found under Chapter 393 of the Florida Statutes, and we're going to be explaining today how guardian advocacies differ uh, from incapacity guardianships and some of the policy considerations, benefits, and potential disadvantages of selecting a guardian advocacy versus selecting an incapacity proceeding. Guardian advocacies have several requirements before um, a, a young adult would qualify to uh, go this route. The, the first one determines whether a young adult can even have a guardian advocate. And that is prior to that uh, child's 18th birthday, he or she must have been medically diagnosed with one of the following. And this is very specific. And, and those conditions are autism, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, Phelan McDermott syndrome, prater willi syndrome, spina bifida, or intellectual disability. And if a child has not been diagnosed prior to their 18th birthday with one of these um, conditions, then a guardian advocacy does not apply to that child. And so it's very important uh, for, for parents who want to consider a guardian advocacy, if your child has one of these conditions or you suspect they do, but there hasn't been a medical diagnosis, that that be completed prior to the child's 18th birthday. The majority of these are fairly self-explanatory in that you will know if your child has been diagnosed with spina bifida or with Down syndrome. The one that's a little more vague is intellectual disability. And that is defined in the statutes as a significantly sub-average general intellectual functioning that exists concurrently with deficits in adaptive behavior. So what that means is that there are, the child's performance would be two or more standard deviations from the mean score on a standardized intelligence test. And Deficits in adaptive behavior measures the effectiveness or degree with which the child meets the standards of personal independence and social responsibility expected of his or her age, cultural group, and community. So generally, you're looking at an intelligence score and then um, the ability to which that child is able to be um, appropriately independent and socially responsible for uh, his or her age. And, and again, that would have to be diagnosed um, as an intellectual disability prior to age 18 before a guardian advocacy would be available to for that child. There is no automatic presumption of incapacity. So uh, Florida statute section 393.121a makes it clear that a person with a developmental disability, including those that, that were just listed, is not automatically presumed under the law to be incapacitated and is not necessarily uh, and automatically denied the full exercise of all of their legal rights. So 
unless further action is taken, a person with a developmental disability will be treated under the law as any other individual would. So if you have a child um, who meets the requirement that they have one of the diagnoses that was included under number one, and that that diagnosis was uh, provided prior to the age of 18, the next thing that you have to look at to determine whether the child would qualify as a guardian advocate or for a guardian advocate is that the diagnosis disorder or syndrome under number one constitutes a substantial handicap. So it, it affects the child's life in a substantial way and that that can reasonably be expected to continue indefinitely. Um, this is typically for children becoming young adults where you expect that their condition is one that will be with them for their lifetime or at least for the greater part of their lifetime. And then the, the third requirement is that the young adult lacks some, but not all decision-making abilities to make informed decisions about his or her care and treatment services. And or that the young adult lacks some, but not all decision-making ability to meet the essential requirements for his or her physical health and safety. And, and just as anecdotal evidence for this, I see this in my practice primarily with young adults who have uh, one of the de developmental disabilities that was defined under number one, but they are generally um, high functioning enough that many times they have a part-time job. Um, sometimes they live on their own, either in an apartment or um, you know, some other housing that is near their, their parents or their loved ones for some additional care when needed. They are able to you know, have friends, have a social life, function within society, but they need a little extra help with certain things, especially, um, you know, often with understanding money, budgeting, um, understanding that um, there are people in the world who might take advantage of you and some help in navigating their social relationships. These are, these are kids and, and young adults who, um, you know, like it says, they lack some, but they don't lack all of their decision-making abilities. If you have a child who has, uh, is reaching age 18, they have been diagnosed with one of the medical diagnoses um, that we first talked about, but they lack all of their decision-making ability. Um, they can't do any of the decision-making tasks that are necessary to care for themselves or to care for their property then a, an incapacity guardianship proceeding may be more appropriate. So there can be varying degrees of any of those disabilities that were mentioned in number one. Um, and and you know, not all children who have been diagnosed with one of those conditions is an appropriate choice for a guardian advocacy. If, it, if they are highly limited in their decision-making or in um, what they can do for themselves, this may not be the best way to meet their needs. So you wanna consider the, the ability, the functionality of, of the young adult and what, uh, what help they're going to need as far as whether the guardian advocacy will meet that need. In talking about whether to choose um, to pursue a guardian advocacy for a, a child reaching 18 or a young adult versus an in incapacity proceeding, there are some potential what are often viewed as benefits of a guardian advocacy and, and reasons that people might say, I would like to do a guardian advocacy for my child rather than pursue an incapacity proceeding. Um, the first, is, is mainly financial. There are lower court filing fees for a guardian advocacy. And, and that financial aspect continues on into number two. After a guardian advocacy is established, there is not a requirement for continued representation from by an attorney. So most people, um, you don't have to have an attorney represent you if, if you are trying to become a guardian advocate for a young adult. I find that, um, 
that people are well served to have one. Um, I, I help people set those up, but there's not a requirement that you have one and there's no requirement that you be represented by an attorney as you um, continue in that guardian advocacy. Generally, the reporting requirements for guardian advocates are substantially relaxed in comparison to an incapacity proceeding. Uh, typically for an incapacity proceeding, as we discussed, the guardian will be required to do a detailed annual accounting as well as an annual plan. Most of my guardian advocates um, have been allowed by the court to do just a simplified affidavit attesting to where the, um, where the young adult is living and how they are doing. It's not as onerous for the person who's serving as, as guardian advocate. The third thing is that a guardian advocacy um, avoids labeling the young adult as incapacitated. So the important thing to understand about a guardian advocacy is there is not an incapacity um, hearing. There is not a determination of incapacity. The child does not meet with the examining committee or the young adult does not meet with the examining committee. And um, you know their rights are not permanently removed by the court, you know, they're removed by the, for the, for the um, duration of the guardian advocacy. So this, this is sort of, um, you know, and, and I've heard it referred to as more like a voluntary uh, uh, guardianship in terms of the court has not actually found that the person has an incapacity. And, and that can be important for parents who um, are concerned about stigma or are concerned about the, the child and the way in which they view themselves. Sometimes they feel like that is a benefit for their child to not have that incapacity or incapacitated label. And the fourth thing is that um, termination is potentially more expansive. It's not as uh, onerous or um, to try to terminate a guardian advocacy if you believe that the young adult now no longer needs the guardian advocate. It's a little more vague what the requirements are to do that. And um, Sanja, if you want to um, sort of comment on any of these or what you've seen in your practice in terms of potential benefits um, or, or at least the perceived potential benefits that, that clients have of a guardian advocacy versus an incapacity. Uh, for sure, sure. Um, you know, I can go along with the the um, the numbers as you as you have them there. One of the things um, that I think, I, yeah, I also want to mention is things that aren't different between the two. Um, so, with lower court filing fees, that is that is absolutely true for guardian advocacies, um, but something that isn't different from a 744 determination of incapacity and appointment would be filing fees if the ward is determined to be indigent. What a lot of families don't realize is that once their young adult turns 18, it's their assets that are counted, not the family's assets. So it's very likely that that young adults could, or, or you as a parent or natural guardian on behalf of that young adult prior to their 18th birthday, could help complete a financial affidavit uh, and the clerk would determine them to be indigent. Um, which means that their income level falls below the, the state set threshold, which I want to say is or roughly $1,000. I don't have that number on, off the top of my head. But um, if they're not, you know, if they don't have a job outside of the home, <clears throat> and if they're not able to support themselves, they probably would qualify. Um, in that instance, the state will pay the filing fees. They will pay for the court appointed attorney's fees because in both types of guardianship cases, the court is going to, an, to appoint an attorney for the alleged incapacitated person, or in this case, the, um, the, the young adult, young disabled adult, um, for the, since there are no examining, there is no examining committee appointed in this kind of a guardianship proceeding, um, that doesn't apply anyway, but usually the state will also pick up the cost of uh, certified copies of the letters uh, um, appointing the guardian advocacy or guardian advocates. So um, a lot of people aren't aware that that is an extra benefit too. So um, if you are a family member and you are seeking a guardian advocacy, uh, be aware that that's a, that is a possible way to uh, lower the filing fees for your family and the other costs that are involved in establishing the guardianship. 
Um, additionally, something else that is that is also the same is that uh, anybody can serve as a guardian advocate, similarly to Chapter 744, where anyone can serve as a, a guardian for an incapacitated adult, but you have to be over 18 years old. You still have to undergo a level two background screening. Um, and in most jurisdictions also, they'll do a, a credit check as well. I think you know we've had that happen for clients, even if they weren't seeking to be appointed uh, guardian over property. So the, um, you know, we've talked about this, I believe in the, in the, in the first session, but the, the way that these are handled still vary from circuit to circuit. And so it's very important that if you are seeking a guardianship to be established, that you contact the, the local clerk's office um, that handles their guardianship filings. It's the probate division in Central Florida. Um, something else that you can find, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, on most websites is because guardian advocates are not required to have attorneys, uh, most courts provide uh, a packet. I've got one here from Seminole County. I know Orange County provide, provides one online that give you the steps. Um, you know, how, now that everything is um, online filing, email or e-filing, it gives you the, the website, you know, click to, to file any of the paperwork that you need to file. Um, some of them even provide forms. So um, while, it, of course, it's not a replacement for an attorney's advice, it is a way that you can proceed without needing to have an attorney. And, you know, Erica, you mentioned before, and I agree, I've, I've helped a number of families establish guardian advocacies and then have withdrawn after they understand what their responsibilities are on an annual ongoing basis. Um, but there are times like this past year where the law changes and the requirements to, you know, what, what information is necessary to include in those annual reports wouldn't be something that they would otherwise know unless they, they had an attorney who's able to represent them. So, you know, um, just something to be mindful of. Uh, it might always be a good idea to have, have, have the attorney's number available to get a consultation when you need it. Um, let's see. Uh, the... Powers and duties really don't change. Once a guardian advocate is appointed, they are still governed by Chapter 744 um, requirements. Um, you know, they still, like Erica mentioned, you've got to file an annual plan every year and accounting if there are funds. Um, accountings aren't required generally if the only income that uh, a disabled adult receives is Social Security um, benefits, SSDI. Uh, Typically, if the guardian is also the rep payee, they don't need to report that to the, to the court. And if you're in a circuit that requires it, you can always file a petition requesting that the court waive that. Um, both guardians appointed under 744 and under 393 are gonna be required to take, uh, they've got four months from the date of their appointment to take a, a course, a guardianship course. Um, that is, you know, I know that currently the Office of Public and Professional Guardians are in the process of establishing new courses that are updated because I know some of the ones that are around uh, and available in the various circuits are, are, are dated. Uh, and with COVID, I think many are offered virtually online right now. Um, but it's an eight hour course. Uh, and in Central Florida, the statewide public guardianship office offers that. Uh, and if even if it is a course offered here in, in Central Florida, if you are in South Florida, your circuit, your chief judge may accept that course. Uh, and then that certificate, once you've completed it, will need to be filed um, with the court to show the evidence that you've um, met that requirement. Um, and termination. In a 744 guardianship, if uh, an incapacitated person has regained um, the ability to uh, assume some of the rights that were otherwise removed, you would file a document called a suggestion of capacity. In a guardian advocacy, it's a suggestion of restoration of rights. And there is the showing, so in a 744 guardianship, uh, the court would then appoint one examining committee member to reevaluate the ward, submit that report to the court, and then there'll be a hearing to determine whether or not the rights should be restored. Um, it's 
it's more expansive in a guardian advocacy because uh, really a statement, your statement from a, a medical physician, a psychiatrist, um, a psychologist or other psychiatric practitioner, which leaves open, can it be uh, a nurse practitioner or you know, does it need to be a medical doctor? Probably not. Um, but who has evaluated um, the disabled adult can file their statement along with the suggestion of restoration of rights, uh, indicating that they support that effort. And so long as no um, objections are filed after, uh, or objections are filed to the restoration effort, uh, the court will um, restore those rights that the um, um, a disabled adult has regained. So um, I have seen that happen without hearing if there's no objection. Um, although I think that the statute does provide for a hearing. Uh, again, circuits handle it differently. So it's always good to, to be aware of the procedure in your, in your jurisdiction. Thanks, Sancha. And this is a footnote to uh, what Sancha was just saying in terms of rights. For anyone who did not join us last month for the 744 incapacity presentation, there is a list of rights that can be delegated to a guardian. Those are the same for a guardian advocacy. So certain things as far as making medical decisions, um, determining social interactions and where um, the ward's going to live, financial, helping with making financial decisions. And then there are certain listed rights that can be removed from the disabled adult, but not given to a guardian advocacy, things like the right to vote or the right to marry or the right to have a driver's license. A guardian advocacy is similar to the uh, 744 in capacity guardianship in that in your petition for the guardian advocacy, the person seeking the guardian advocacy needs to list as they do in the 744 petition, exactly which rights they feel that the disabled adult is unable to exercise and which ones would be then be delegated to the guardian advocate versus simply removed from the disabled adult. So when we're talking about a removal of rights, it is not a, a global or a, a vague or undefined removal of rights, but um, a very specific removal of just those rights that that uh, adult is unable to do. And that may be just one or two things. It may be several, it may be most of the, of the options available. Um, typically for an incapacity guardianship, I tend to see that it's usually closer to all of the available rights that, that may be removed that people are trying to remove due to um, the level of disability that the, or level of incapacity that that person is um, under. But for a guardian advocacy, I often see that it's maybe just a selection of a couple of these rights, um, because like we like we said, these are largely uh, young adults and adults who can function uh, to some degree with the, in everything that they need for daily living, but there are some aspects of their life where they just need some help. You know, Erica, I think this is one of the most um, most important areas. Uh, when you're, when well, at least when I am meeting with with clients and with families who have um, children who are, you know, usually they'll they'll come and see me at 17, and sometimes I get parents who hear about guardian advocacy from a friend, and they they call me and they're like, oh my gosh, do I need to know about this? I'm like, no, if your child's 12, you got a ways to go. Let's see, let's see how well they do, you know, with with um, OT and speech therapy and applied behavioral. Like, there's a lot of things that, that are out there available that can increase capacity. And what you're looking at is when they're 18, how are they doing when they're 18? I mean, I think um, any anyone who's ever been a teenager, which is everybody on this on this virtual meeting, I think, um, I hope, um, has knows that you know, I mean, there's a certain maturity level that comes and trying for parents who have children, and I know because I am one, you've got children who have varying special needs and trying to gauge where they are uh, can be very difficult either because you are too close to it um, and you're optimistic and you're focused on all of the things that they can do um, 
or you are more of a helicopter parent. And I'll put myself right there. I, I, I worry so much about my, my son that um, maybe I overdo it sometimes. So it's good to have a third party perspective. And I tell my, my families that come in to see me, talk to the doctor, talk to the therapist. They see kids all the time. They're treating kids who have autism. They're treating kids who are who would otherwise fall under guardian advocacy. And, and what do they think? Do they think um, that this is gonna be beneficial or, or do they think you really need to look at a 744 guardianship? Now, most of the time they, they may not know the distinction and that's why it's helpful to talk to an attorney to help you make those decisions. But for instance, um, a, a child who has had a brain injury at a young age, who suffers from a lot of the same difficulties in um, you know, dealing with light sensitivity and sound and may react similar to a child who's been diagnosed on the autism spectrum, would not necessarily qualify for guardian advocacy because they don't fit into this box that this statute provides. And um, you know, for that reason, I think that this there's a lot that could be done for this statute because a, somebody who has a, a brain injury, for instance, can also improve over time. And the benefit about having a, a guardian advocacy is that as they, as they grow, as they learn, as they develop, develop, as their brain recovers and they're more able to you know, handle the, the, their daily needs um, and make you know, decisions that need to be made um, to help care for themselves, you can back down on the assistance that they're getting by filing a, a suggestion for restoration. So, um, you know, really evaluating what is appropriate at the time is, is very important. And, and Sancha raises two really good points right there in what she was just talking about. And first is the idea that a guardian advocacy is once the child has reached 18. So just, just to be perfectly clear on that, I have a lot of parents call me and it's my child will be 18 and six months. And, and that's a fine time to start talking about it, to open a file, but in terms of actually filing for the guardian advocacy, the child needs to have reached age 18, um, not just be approaching age 18. And then Sancha also takes us into our next slide, which is discussing some of the policy considerations for guardian advocacy and how the uh, guardian advocacy statute may be changed or improved in the future to meet some of these challenges that, that come along with a guardian advocacy. And, and, you know, she was hitting on number one, which is that the guardian advocacy is not a proceeding that's available in all cases, even though the functionality of two children may be the same. So you may have one child who is diagnosed prior to age 18 with one of the um, required or, or necessary disabilities under requirement number one, you have another child, as Sancha says, with a brain injury that does not necessarily fall under those diagnoses. And those children uh, react largely the same as young adults. They may need largely the same um, you know, help and, and guidance through um, someone is in their decision making. One of them may qualify for a guardian advocacy, one of them may not and in that case would have to do, uh, depending on the level of assistance they needed, potentially a 744 incapacity guardianship. So, and, and Sancha, I don't know if you've heard anything about any consideration of that policy or any um, potential change that has ever been discussed with that or, or advocacy in that direction. Not to change 393. I know there are a number of efforts that were pending before the legislature now um, in, in helping to make dis in decision making, which really I think, and that's just a, a personal opinion is that they could go back to 393 and, and, and rework that. But it, it's really a very similar idea without, as, without the court oversight. And while some, some people may look at the court oversight as being overly burdensome or costly and just an unnecessary expense for a family that's been taking care of their, um, their child all of their lives up until that point. But it really is to provide a protection because there are unfortunately abuses out there. And most of the time, in my experience in the attorneys I've talked to, it's family members where that happens. It isn't actually um, professional guardians. But um, 
Yeah, I think, so I, the short answer is I don't know of anything, um, any efforts uh, to change 393 at this point. Um, I do think though, Erica, um, if anyone uh, has or is um, caring for a young adult who's been part of a dependency action, there is a loophole in that in 393 where I think that the, the filing can occur 180 days before their 18th birthday. So there is a, a very small carve out. Um, I have been successful in a case one time um, <laughs> being able to file things so long as the hearing was scheduled after their 18th birthday. Um, but the, that carve out is very specific because 393 really deals with children who've um, been removed um, you know, from their parents for whatever reason or other dependency issues. Thanks, Sancha. Um, and then the second thing that Sancha and I wanted to talk about in terms of policy considerations for guardian advocacy is there is not nearly as developed case law for guardian advocacy issues as there is for incapacity guardianships. And as a result, there are potentially fewer enforcement mechanisms and less teeth in a guardian advocacy if something were to go wrong or someone was to take advantage of a vulnerable adult. And, and I'll give you an example that Sancha and I were discussing, but I have a guardianship. This is an incapacity guardianship. Um, my, the ward in that case uh, does not have the right to contract. The ward made some less than savory friends who determined that, that he was vulnerable and exploited that by taking him to a car dealership, talking him into um, signing over his car in exchange for a more expensive newer vehicle. His car was paid for, now he would be the subject of a financing agreement and owe quite a bit of money. And soon thereafter that same day, after he drove the car off the lot, it was promptly stolen from him by these individuals who were his quote unquote friends and he ended up without a car at all. Because it was an incapacity guardianship, because he had been determined incapacitated, his right to contract had been removed by order of the court, we were able to get a court order that those transactions in which he engaged, and, and that is making a trade-in of his current vehicle, signing a financing agreement for a new vehicle, were all void. Um, if, if that, those transactions were to be put in place, his guardian would have needed to do those for him because his guardian had been delegated the right to contract on, on the ward's behalf. And therefore we were able to get an order um, for ordering the car dealership to either give him back his original car or to replace that with a car of similar value and to avoid the financing agreement. Sancha and I were saying if that had been a guardian advocacy and it had been uh, maybe an adult in their 20s with a guardian advocate in place and that same situation had happened, we fear that with less case law in place and um, without a determination of incapacity, that would have been a little bit harder to enforce. I'm not sure that the end result would have been the same. And for that reason, for, for you know, being able to address some of the vulnerabilities that may come with some of these disabilities, an incapacity guardianship can actually be um, beneficial simply because the law is more developed and there is uh, more protection for the ward in several cases. And, and Sancha, I don't know if you've seen this in your practice or, or want to share any anecdotal uh, stories about that, but. You know, um, when we were talking about this, Erica, I have a very similar, um, I've heard from a therapist, one of my clients' therapists, that um, something similar with a car happened. Um, although I don't know the specifics, I, I know that it was, you know, a very similar situation. What I can draw um, a correlation with is, like you mentioned before, voluntary guardianships are very similar uh, in, in the way that there is no order determining incapacity. The, the rights are just sort of assigned to the guardian. Um, and in a voluntary guardianship, um, you know, a, a, it's still a guardianship. So it's, there's still a ward that can only happen um, for property. 
And I have had a client who was under a voluntary guardianship and had uh, his identity stolen. Um, you know, he was not able to move around um, and, and get places, but apparently uh, somebody impersonated him and had a mortgage um, on his, you know, they, they signed a mortgage to put a, a mortgage lien on his house. And we discovered that. And in, in dealing with trying to get that removed um, from his record, which I mean, you can imagine the, just, just to find that suddenly was um, uh, less than exciting for both the guardian uh, and the ward who still had capacity, um, but just simply wasn't able to manage his own, his own affairs and decided to have someone uh, take care of those things for him. But it was, you know, the issue was raised, well, he's not unable to do this. So this could have been him. We got to a point where, um, you know, and say, no, he's under a guardianship. He, he could not possibly have done this. But I can see in that circumstance, and it, thankfully, you know, it, it did not, we were, we were able to deal with that for him. We had that removed, but, um, and charges pressed, but <laughs> against the wrongdoer, you know, when you have somebody who has some level of capacity, but not total capacity, perhaps, they really are ripe for undue influence. And, and so, you know, it, it's, it, it is frightening to, to have, you know, someone that you care about um, who's dealing with those sorts of things, but um, trying to make the decision about what is the most protection you can provide them, it, it, it is 744 because there is still so much uh, gray area out there with 393. I don't think that it has been, I don't think that that has been tested in, in Florida yet. And, um, and I think you you would have an, a, a very good argument that they still have capacity or it has not been removed. Well, and, and you know, what Sancha is saying is exactly right as far as many of these individuals due to the disability, you know, they are ripe as far as being vulnerable. And, and that's exactly generally what parents are trying to protect um, that young adult from when they come and, and they seek um, some type of guardianship is either from past experience or just knowing that their child is potentially a little more naive or a little less sophisticated in certain transactions, maybe doesn't have the same understanding of the value of money or the value of goods and services. Um, they can be talked into some things that maybe um, a, a normally developing you know, 19 year old wouldn't be talked into doing it. And that's exactly the, the parents concern is that that's going to happen. And, and like Sanja is saying, for those issues where there is a vulnerability, you know, a guardian advocacy is potentially maybe seen as more convenient, less hassle, but um, it is important to remember that if vulnerability is a main concern that it won't necessarily provide the, the most protection. And you may wanna consider a 744 in capacity guardianship at that point. And, and that's not true for all people. Some, some people, you know, for the young adult, um, based on their functionality, the, the vulnerability may not be as big a concern. But I know for most parents I see who are seeking a guardian advocacy for a child who's becoming a young adult, vulnerability is a key component of why they feel that some type of a guardianship would be beneficial for their child. And you know that brings us to the big takeaway um, that we want everyone to understand from, from watching this presentation today is that you can have a, a child reaching adulthood who has one of the disabilities described in requirement number one, who has been diagnosed prior to age 18. And just because they meet the requirements um, where they're able to do some but not all of their decision making, they may not be um, the right candidate for a guardian advocacy. That may not be the best thing to protect that child's interest. And determining whether to uh, pursue a guardian advocacy versus to pursue an incapacity guardianship really requires a case-by-case -case assessment of the needs and the limitations of the young adult, uh, what their functionality is, what the parent is trying to um, protect them from, what their vulnerabilities are. And so, you know, don't never, never just jump into a guardian advocacy. That's where a, an attorney, as Sancha was saying, can be really helpful 
in helping you determine the differences between the two. And once you work with your medical professional for that child and, and figure out what those limitations are and what the, what the vulnerabilities are, an attorney can really be helpful in advising which of the guardianship options might be best for that particular young adult. We thank you for coming today. We are certainly happy to answer questions. Um, we have enjoyed doing these presentations and if anyone has any questions or Kim, if you have questions, we would certainly entertain those now. Well, I, I can't thank you guys enough again for bringing such valuable information in this three-part series. It's been a lot of information. I first, I do have a couple of questions and if our audience doesn't, um, I'm, I'm happy to, fill the space with a lot of questions because again, you brought out so many different issues and I kept thinking about people who fall through the cracks. And so my first question was, as you're dealing with the, I think was seven or eight defined disabilities, who is determining the definitions of those dis disabilities? And then further, if you are a person who doesn't have the privilege to work with a neuropsychologist or you weren't identified in the school system or you were improperly identified in the school system, how is that dealt with? Because you, because according to your presentation in the law, they have to be diagnosed before 18, even to get the ball started. And um, I just think about record keeping um, as a former trial attorney and how hard that must be for the average parent um, to get to 18 and then realize maybe I didn't do what I needed to do to do what I have to do now. I hope that makes sense. It does, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to address the second part of um, your question, the, the record keeping, absolutely. And guardians, once they're appointed, once you're appointed a guardian, you're supposed to keep those records for three years after your discharge. So it's not just keeping mm -hmm. all the records during the guardianship, but it's, it's even beyond that. But um, I have had a case um, in particular that the, the young adult uh, has autism um, and has been treating uh, not with a pediatrician because he's been you know, over the age of 18 for a number of years, but the, the family came to me to have a guardianship established and we were having the discussion of, well, which kind is gonna be appropriate? He qualifies for this, but can we, do we have all the elements? Can we prove this? And they were unable to, because it had been such a long time and the pediatrician mm -hmm. was no longer in business and she did not have the records showing that he'd been diagnosed prior to age 18, um, that we didn't have a choice. And the, and the current physician was not willing to rely on um, the diagnosis or what they have known of him to, to sign something to that effect because they were not the doctor that made the initial diagnosis. So we had to proceed with the 744. So it, it really does make a difference uh, in, in keeping those records. And you know, it, it is a difficult thing for families to think about when you're, when you've got a four and five-year-old child, you know, do I, because you're not sure where, how far they're going to go and you're optimistic mm -hmm. and you want to be helpful um, and, and you want to do the best thing for them. So yes, hanging on to records. <laughs> well, and Kim, you bring up an interesting point too, in terms of individuals who may not have been diagnosed ever as a child um, and maybe later in their life. And, and I'm thinking specifically of individuals who may be on the autism spectrum, but have been highly functioning and, you know, didn't have parents who sort of realized that or saw that symptomology. And maybe now they're in their late twenties or early thirties. And they're saying, I don't relate to my peers in the same way you know, they're starting to notice things about themselves. And I know some people who have, you know, gone to get care later in life and, and said, you know, I, I think I may have this and or, or go through those diagnoses after age 18. Same situation where, you know, they don't fit the criteria of the statute is written but you know that they had it prior to age mm -hmm. 18, you know, most likely, you know, it's not something that you expect just to come on out of the blue, but, you know, didn't have that, didn't have that diagnosis, didn't realize that they actually had um, that condition. And so, you know, don't qualify under the, the terms of the statute. And then for the intellectual disability, you all set a specific standard. Does that ever change? You know, you, you also think about the, 
there were so many, of course, some of the disabilities were well-defined. And so you would think there's no gray area with those, but for particularly for autism, for the intellectual disability, I, you know, I, I'm not a, a doctor, but I don't know if that changes. And, you know, when you all are considering that, how does that impact your decision about incapacity? So chapter, sorry, Erica. So chapter 393 does define mm -hmm. Prater Will Eye syndrome and cerebral palsy and autism. Mm -hmm. they, they do provide a definition. Um, mm -hmm. So it's legislative. It's in, it's okay. in the statute. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this statute is a lot younger than 744, although it's gone some, <laughs> it's gone through a lot of changes <laughs> um, every year, just about for a while. But uh, so uh, unfortunately 393 has not. I do not know, but I assume that they, um, you know, use some common medical terminology. They had, you know, some advice from physicians and others to to include that language. But it is in Chapter 393. Um, you know, developmental disability is defined as um, Erica's uh, slide indicated. You know, with those specific diagnoses, and then below that, they, those are each specifically de defined. Okay. And I was going to say, too, I find it very interesting what you said about, you know, the child has some capabilities and can thrive and um, it's capable of doing many activities of daily living. So the child is also capable of saying no. So <laughs> what happens when you get to 18 and you are trying to do this, of course, after they've reached the majority and I'm taking some notes that I'm looking at. And um, now they have been looking, I don't know, at campaigns for voting all this time or wanted to drive or have strong intentions to marry or contract to get their car and you're trying to determine um, which you can, which, which uh, rights you wanna take, a, would try to limit rather, and which rights you think they're still capable of. How does that even look from a pragmatic standpoint? From when the child I says no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, to, to be successful, what I have seen in my practice as far as this working well to where we, we progress to, to asking for our agrarian advocacy is a tremendous amount of communication, you know, appropriate communication between the parent and the child. Because typically once I meet with the family, um, and, and I like to talk to the child too, but typically they have realized um, realized some of their own vulnerabilities. And if you have a child who doesn't recognize that yet, it's gonna be significantly more difficult. Um, in most cases where I have talked to the child, it's, you know, I had one recently where the child told me, I understood, Stan, I don't really know math. I'm not good at it. I can't really figure out money and I understand that I can't do that. And so because these children have, um, you know, a higher functionality, they are often able to see their own, um, their own vulnerabilities and their own lack of functionality in comparison to um, normally developing peers. And, and they can see some of the things that they can't do. And, you know, they are often cooperative with I understand that mom and dad think I need a little bit of help in this area and maybe I do, so I'm okay with that. That really is what, what sets the foundation for a positive and uh, successful guardian advocacy. Mm -hmm. You are going, yes, if, if the child does not want it and um, if the child can't see their own, that they have some limitations, so it just feels like I'm 18 now and mom and dad are in my business <laughs> and I don't need them <laughs> to be. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I want to do what my friends are doing and their moms and dads aren't in their business. Yes, that can serve as a substantial um, impediment just to having a guardian advocacy be a positive experience, which, you know, it really makes a big difference in everyone's well-being and happiness if, you know, the, the, the young adult enters in willingly and is willing to, to work with the guardian advocate and communicate with the guardian advocate and recognizes the benefit that the guardian advocate is providing to them. You know, yeah. um, I had, there's a, a local practitioner who, and, and by the way, just as anybody can file a petition uh, for a guardian advocate, to appoint a guardian advocate, 
um, the young adult can also be a petitioner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a colleague locally who um, has a daughter with a disability and with the group she started, um, more, more like what you were talking about, Erica, where you, you really make it a family, um, family affair. Um, you know, as the, the legal practitioner, we've got certain ethical duties and in guardianship, it really extends to, to a ward as well um, and the disabled ad adult as well. So um, if, the, if there is a way to engage them in the process and, and explain it in a way that, you know, I've been helping you all of these years make these decisions. Yes, when you're 18, you're gonna have all these responsibilities now. If you want me to still help you, I can. And here's what we have to do to make that happen. I'd like for you, let, let's explore what happens with the court. Let's, you know, let's do this together and keep in mind, they're gonna have their own attorney. And I have had cases where the, the young adult was exactly what you said, Erica. Well, no, no, I, I, all these years, I've been, they've been telling me as soon as I'm 18, I can do this myself. I can decide <laughs> if I wanna play my Xbox at midnight. I can, you know. And then, and then you're discussing just family household rules, which is a different, <laughs> different altogether. Yeah. <laughs> but those those petitions can be filed without without them participating. You can have an attorney that shows up on their behalf that is going to have to express their objection. You know, I'm sorry, my client uh, does not believe that he should uh, have to assign his rights to determine who he spends his social time with, and. Mm -hmm you know, it's going to depend on your judge, it's going to depend on every case, but they can be filed. It just sure is a whole lot nicer for the family mm -hmm. going forward if it can be approached in a more uh, collaborative way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes there have been experiences that a parent can draw on to illustrate to a child what the benefits would be. I had one situation in which um, the, the young adult was on the autism spectrum and pretty high functionality, but didn't fully appreciate the, the value of money and, and sort of how, how you protect your savings. And, um, you know, her, her boyfriend who also has some, some, you know, functionality issues and, and some disability, but not, not trying to uh, be, be mean or take advantage of her, but had asked her for her debit card and had himself not fully understanding what that meant in terms of practical things when you, when you use the debit card around town to buy anything that looks attractive to you at the, at the time, had spent the money in her account. And when it came time to talk about what a guardian advocacy could offer for that young adult you know, her, her, her mom was able to say, you know, you remember when, when so-and-so you gave him the debit card and, and he, he used the money and, you know, if I had been helping and, and, you know, that probably wouldn't have happened and you'd still have that money. And some of the times there have been things like that, that have happened where the parent is actually able to illustrate to the child that they don't recognize their own uh, vulnerabilities or their own um, challenges that, that they're able to illustrate what would happen and, and how they might have how they might have helped the child in that case to um, to avoid a hard lesson learned. And in the it takes a village mentality, you can have therapists and doctors help have these discussions with the young adult before they turn 18. I know mm -hmm. that um, my son is 15, and one of his physicians gave him a form that basically introduced the fact to him, you know, that, that you're going to be 18 in a couple of years and you're going to have to be making these decisions. So we expect for you to show up at your appointment and have something to say, and we're not going to start looking at mom. So they're trying to kind of groom them already. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I wasn't expect. I sure would have liked them to tell me they were going to do that first, but um, <laughs> it does happen <laughs> and they're, they're right. And I think that by the by the young adult having their own attorney, I mean that that's true in an incapacity guardianship as well that the ward is represented. But I think that in an incapacity guardianship, the ward is often not as capable of having some of the conversations that a young adult who is um, a party to a guardian advocacy can can have with their attorney because of the higher functionality. And I think that that helps them to feel like an adult and to feel independent because, you know, mom and dad have their attorney, but 
I have my own attorney and, you know, I, I can tell my attorney and he's going to talk for me or she's going to talk for me. And I get a chance to talk to the judge and the judge is important and, and they're listening to me. And um, so I find that that typically, um, you know, I really haven't had a guardian advocacy that has been a, a negative environment. You know, usually it, it has been very positive, very affirming to the young adult who is participating. And it's been very clear to them that everyone who is in that room wants what's best for them and wants them to be everything that they want to be and can be and is assisting them in that. It's not so much, we're trying to limit what you can do, we're trying to expand what you can do mm -hmm. and, and help you reach your, your highest potential and, and help you in any way we can. And I think that when it's approached like that, you end up with, um, you know, a, a good experience all the way around for, for both the person petitioning for the guardian advocacy, but also for the for the young adult who's going to be the subject of that. A couple of more questions before we get to the last one we have from our audience. And um, I think, Sancha, you said it best, um, ripe for undue influence. That's just something that I just put down as a quote. So when they're working with these entities, whether it's, like, let's just use the car dealership, for example, how is the other party um, without obviously making a judgment call to know that this person does not have the right to enter into an agreement with them. How does that work from the guardianship perspective? They don't. They don't. They don't. Um, you know, it, it is a fear of many parents who have children with hidden disabilities. You know, it's not a genetic anomaly or something that you can see physically, um, but maybe it's cognitive deficits and it sure has been a concern of mine. Um, if, if there is an order determining incapacity and in a car or any other kind of financing scenario, if they're going to do a name search, mm -hmm. something will come up in the public records that indicates that there is a, an issue there, um, or that there is a document that's been filed in the probate or guardianship proceeding. They won't be able to get access, but it, it is enough information. It's, it's out there to put them on notice if they're doing what they're supposed to do. The problem is most of the time, like Erica was saying, is, is it's people who are trying to get around that already. Um, but you sure do have uh, you know, an order to use to fight any kind of a contract. And, and like Erica was able to do, have them voided um, and, and have that money or the car or the you know, equal value returned uh, to that person. Yeah, I think Kim, that's you. You know, that is an excellent point, and that's the huge, the huge threat to um, you know these young adults is that because they are functional in many ways, and because they often have sort of a more hidden, um, you know, cognitive challenge, that people interact with them in the same way that they would interact with someone who didn't have these these disabilities and so um they can get themselves into situations where things aren't being explained to them where they don't understand and the other party doesn't necessarily realize that they don't understand and and that's not always the fault of the other party mm -hmm. you know depending on the interaction you're not going to necessarily search or do different things and that's why having the enforcement on the back end Mm -hmm. um, like that you do for the 744 really can make a difference because if you find yourself in one of these situations, it is easier to extract a young adult from one of those transactions, um, you know, under, if they're under a 744 incapacity guardianship and have been determined incapacitated, than it is to extract them when they are under a guardian advocacy. So, um, you know, that's, that's one thing definitely to remember in choosing which one, you know, a, a parent might choose to petition under is that there, there is that greater enforcement possibility uh, for the 744 guardianships. Mm -hmm. And to follow up on that, in the petition, when you are seeking a guardian advocacy, whatever rights you, you have to include in your pleading, what rights you are seeking to have assigned. And if you don't include it, they retain all the other rights. Mm -hmm. So it is up to, and again, with, without an attorney to assist you, that could be difficult. You may not realize, you know, exactly what you should be asking for. Um, and uh, again, communicating with, with the medical professionals uh, ahead of time helps, helps to do that as well. 
you know, yeah, that's you just said a mouthful. I don't yeah. think most people would know what to ask for. Well, no, and it's such a difficult line to walk because, you know, most parents are trying to afford their, their child the greatest degree of independence that that child can have. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they don't want to be quick to say, well, there may be some situation in the future where this could be an issue. So at this point, I'm going to take that away. Um, and so sometimes they're maybe a little too conservative in the rights that they have delegated and they find later, uh, you know, I should, I probably should have had that right delegated. And I mean, you can, you can petition it and get that change, but it's not always quickly enough to, you know, protect the child. So what Sancha's saying, as far as working with medical professionals is, is so important because they can help a parent who is trying to make those difficult determinations to better decide what a what a child is really capable of doing um, under different circumstances. Well, my last question leads into the question again from the panelists, and that is, you mentioned the you know who you choose, who you select to do this task is very important. The trust mm -hmm. issue is beyond high, and often you said family may want to jump in and then they may want to jump out and there's annual requirements and financial requirements attached to this. Um, so if you could just explain briefly along with the training, the question is, can you address the appropriate required training for volunteer guardian advocates? And we'll close after that question. That's the question. Well, Sancha, I'll let you address that because I know you addressed it to some degree during the slide. So if you wanted to um, just sort of reiterate some of those requirements. Sure, so the statutes provide that guardians are required to, to have some training that is required and, you, and you, that needs to happen within four months after your letters of uh, guardian advocacy are, are issued to you. Um, the, the, volunteer, the, the term volunteer guardian advocate um, makes me wonder if perhaps this might be a mental health question because there are different types of guardian advocates. There are guardian advocates appointed for um, persons who have been retained in a Baker Act situation, for instance, and that is not the kind of guardian advocacy that we are talking about today. That is completely different. Um, and usually a, a guardian advocate, um, at, at least in my experience, most of the time it is a family member and there are courses um, available through the local circuits, the clerk's office and the circuit where um, you've been appointed usually can provide that information to you and, and almost, I think pretty regularly does to my experience is to let you know who, who to call um, and that information is available online as well. Um, and like I said, that's at least I know locally they're offered virtually. So with, with COVID, but I think they were as well before. Um, it's, there is a cost, um, it's at least again, locally, it's about a hundred dollars. Um, mm -hmm. It's, you know, a day of your time, you know, eight hour course um, and you'll get the certificate when you've completed it and, and then you'll file it. Um, I do know that sometimes I get calls from um, parents and family members after the fact because they have questions because those guardianship courses are designed for everyone that's appointed as a guardian. And sometimes there's information that kind of overlaps between 744 and 393 and people end up having, you know, wait a minute, why are they telling me I need to do this, you know, mm -hmm. annual accounting or whatever. And it doesn't, it's not the same kind of requirements. So, mm -hmm. um, but Yes, anybody can be appointed as long as they have not, you know, they're over the age of 18, they have not committed a felony um, or been uh, charged with, a, you know, abuse or neglect. Uh, and then the background check is done to make sure that that's the case. Well, like Sancha's saying, um, on the on the guardian advocacies, I don't really see professional guardians being appointed. I mean, my, my experience is that it is typically, um, you know, in 99% of the cases, it's a parent or both parents. It's not as common as in say a 744 incapacity guardianship that you would have a professional guardian as a guardian advocate. So in most cases you are talking about um, non-professionals serving in those roles um, just as a, a parent or a loved one. Or the statewide public guardianship office mm -hmm. um, or, or, or a family friend, but the statewide mm -hmm. public guardianship office can be appointed. We um, work with the Osceola County Council on Aging and, and they often serve as guardian advocates. And I do have a number of professional guardians that we've represented that do that on a pro bono basis. Mm -hmm. When um, say, you know, someone who has a developmental disability um, is older in age and then parents or family members have passed 
and then they step in um, on a pro bono basis to help. Yeah, so again, you just added another layer. <laughs> <laughs> we will a lot of layers. Provide, another a lot of layers. <laughs> <laughs> we will try to provide as many of the you know the resources that were provided during these three presentations. Again, David is not present today, but please extend my thank you to him. I will personally later. Sandra, thank you for your time. I know how busy you are serving in the capacity that you do, not just for the region as an attorney, but also for the Florida Bar. Erica, same to you. Thank you so much for the time and effort you put into creating these most meaningful presentations to educate the public. And I hope that they're helpful and live long before we have to redo this again with changes <laughs> that seem to be on the horizon. <laughs> Again, thank you. <laughs> and um, as I said in the beginning, I said we're going to talk a little bit about ISPS. We have uh, three more programs coming up, um, and I believe there's one before this. There's an April 13th program, and that is the reality of running for office. I don't know if we have that slide up for that one, but that, that, there we go. The reality for running for office is a program in collaboration with our um, College, College of Public Policy. I am abbreviating that for those who, of you are, who are watching. And uh, it's just really to let people know how to run for office. It's important as we have a lot of people turning out for young people to understand what they're getting into. So we'll hope you join us for that. Then the next program on the 20th is a conversation with a former ambassador, U.S. Ambassador Delano Lewis. Um, is just going to talk about what it means to be an ambassador to the United States, how he, was, how he was appointed, and that experience that he gleaned from being in the role. Um, and that's going to be done with, uh, in conjunction with many business partners in the area. And then the, we have one more slide, I believe. And our last program is in conjunction with our foundation. And that program is the Social Justice Institute, which was uh, sponsored by the Tampa Bay Super Bowl host committee. And we're doing a day long program. ISPS is only doing the first part. That part is on a COVID series with the Florida Department of Health lead to talk about vaccinations. But there are a host of other opportunities provided by the foundation for the remainder of the, um, of the day. So I wanna thank you again for your time and appreciation. And um, if you have, want to learn more about ISPS, please always go to isps.spcollege.edu or follow us on Facebook. I appreciate your time and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.